that was a good start. <laughs> I meant to drop uh my can I mean I meant to set my controller aside so it wasn't in the way and it fell off where I was trying to put it and dropped it. So good, we're we're starting out well. Here we go. Uh, hi, how y'all doing? Hope y'all look good. We are going to be speaking mainly, not really mainly. I don't really have that much to say about it, but Street Fighter Five. M. Bison was just revealed. Everybody's favorite character, right? Everybody loves that dude. <laughs> Phenomenally exciting gameplay. Iconic character. Iconic moves. Everybody loves him. And so obviously he was just revealed for Street Fighter V. I'm obviously being a little facetious when I say everybody loves him. Most people consider him a very, very boring character to watch. And he definitely can be, but I think like... Bison Rushdown, to me, is some of the most, like, enjoyable shit to watch. I, maybe it's just because I started out in Street Fighter 4 as a Bison player. Maybe I'm a little biased. I don't know. Ha! I'm a biased Bison. Ha <laughs> ha! But, so, the more I see of it, like, obviously, everybody was kind of freaking out when they re uh, released Charlie Nash's gameplay trailer. He has these teleports, doing all kinds of crazy juggles, all kinds of crazy effects to him. And everybody's kind of looking at that and going, like, this is not looking like the Street Fighter that I know and love. What is going on here? And so now it's the same thing with Bison again. He has these seemingly very quick teleports. He now has a fireball of his own. Uh, he's doing juggles, OTGs. He's doing a lot of things that really aren't in Street Fighter 4 right now. And so the more I see of it, the more I'm kind of thinking, like, that... And this is what I was, this was my initial interpretation of Omega Mode when I first saw it was like, they're testing this out. They want to see what people think about this kind of game style for something. And then, you know, when Charlie's trailer was released, it kind of solidified that a little bit. Like, this is very much closer to the style of gameplay we've been seeing in Omega versus what we're seeing in Street Fighter 4 right now. And now again, with the release of Bison, how he's doing these juggles, I'm fairly, I'm actually like 90% certain that a couple of his moves are Omega-only variation of Bison's moves right now. So like, because Omega was a free update, right? You, they didn't, it wasn't DLC, they didn't charge anything for it. And so, you know, a lot of people were sitting around thinking like, man, that's a lot of resources to contribute to something that they're not realistically going to be making any money off of. Unless people end up buying Street Fighter 4 in order to play Omega, which is very unlikely. Omega was just kind of like an afterthought uh, in regard to Ultra. And I'm, I don't think many people still play Omega. I'm not 100% sure on that. I haven't really looked. Uh, but I know it's obviously that uh, Ultra Street Fighter 4 is significantly more popular and more often played than Omega Street Fighter. Uh... But again, like, the more I see of Street Fighter V, the more I'm thinking, like, this was their testing ground. This was their... They're using resources that they're creating for Street Fighter V, or that they intend to create in Street Fighter V, and using them in Omega to see how that shit works. And so I'm really starting to think, like, Street Fighter V is going to be very much similar to what we see in Omega. And it's, you know, it's kind of a little, uh, obviously we haven't seen incredibly high level gameplay of the, well, so far the only characters we've really seen have been Ryu and Chun-Li, right? Because they took it to, I believe they had that build at Evo, um, or maybe, was it Capcom Cup? The One of the, or maybe both, I don't know, I'm pr I know they had it at Capcom Cup, I can't remember if they had the build at Evo, but obviously where you had, uh, Combo Fiend playing Mike Ross, um, and so we've seen some Ryu and Chun-Li, but obviously we have not seen maximized Ryu and Chun-Li. You know, Combo Fiend is obviously working for Capcom, so he knows more about the game than Mike would. But you definitely didn't see the character's full potential throughout that. And when you're looking at it from their point of view, these are Street Fighter players. These are people who are going into this thinking, okay, this is an extension of Street Fighter 4, let me play this under the rules of Street Fighter 4, when obviously, you know, look at the difference between Street Fighter 3rd Strike and Street Fighter 4. They're very different games. Incredibly different games. You can't really carry over knowledge of one game to the other. It doesn't work like that. And so it's kind of the same thing. You're looking at Street Fighter 5 in the light of, oh, I really enjoy Street Fighter 4. 
how does it play like that? How can, what can I do? What can it carry over from Street Fighter 4 to Street Fighter 5? And so far, it's looking like very little. It's looking like they're moving away from the link-based combo system into something more similar to kind of Street Fighter Cross Tekken kind of combos. Where you can do dial a combos into like a launch or some kind of shit, and then you can juggle with a special something. You know, they're definitely, it's definitely very different. It does not take a very observant eye to see that the combo system in Street Fighter V is very different from the combo system in Street Fighter IV, and that there's a lot of additional effects that really didn't exist. Like the aforementioned launching into kind of some sort of juggles. Uh, again, Bison did an OTG head stomp. He can do that. He can knock somebody down and then do an OTG head stomp now. So that's actually somewhat similar to Darkstalkers. If, if you have not played Darkstalkers, there's a feature in that game I cannot... I did not play enough of Darkstalkers to really solidify, like, what you have to do to do it. But every single character has this, like, follow-up attack that they can do on a downed opponent. And they basically just, you know, jump at them and do, like, some kind of stomp on them. Something. And Bison's head stomp there was very similar to that kind of thing. So it's very obvious that Street Fighter V is going to be, I want to say, kind of executionally looser than Street Fighter 4, and I don't know whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Because in terms of just purely technical fighting games, Street Fighter's kind of it. They're Guilty Gear a little bit, but Guilty Gear has that mashing of uh, you need very solid neutral to perform well in this game, but it also has the anime kind of craziness to it. So it's a mixture, whereas Street Fighter 4 is just kind of like... I guess King of Fighters, but King of Fighters did not largely thanks to the terrible net code it's kind of the same thing now with mortal kombat like i know a lot of people are just like eh, fuck mortal kombat the online sucks same thing would have happened with king of fighters 13 except obviously king of fighters did not have the initial install base that mortal kombat has uh but you know having bad on online in this day and age is a game killer it can murder a game from the get-go look at anarchy reigns i continually think about this game now because I downloaded the soundtrack. It has an amazing soundtrack, so I downloaded it. I hear the music fairly often. Because when I'm working, I always just have my iPod on shuffle. So quite often, an Anarchy Rain song will come on. And I'm just sitting there thinking, like, man, what could this game have been if the netcode was effective enough to actually allow you to perform optimally? How much more popular, how much better would the word of mouth have been? How many people would still be playing this right now if the online had been worthwhile? And then you look at something like Dark Souls or Bloodborne, where even though the online isn't particularly optimal, you still see, like, tons of phantom hits. Uh, I know laggy backstabs is one of, like, the biggest complaints in Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. All that shit, it just shows, like, how amazing of a game that this game is from the outset, that people are willing to deal with that suboptimal netcode, suboptimal online gameplay, and still fight and still love it. And how many, and you know, how close it was. Like, if if this game was not as amazing as it was from the outset, if the atmosphere wasn't as amazing, if the PvE wasn't as amazing, how much less lenient would people be toward the games online? Because it does have its flaws. And so having poor online in this day and age is really just, a, it's it can murder a game right away. And I completely forgot where the point was that I was going, where was I going from this? Oh right, because King of Fighters 13 was basically it. Like, King of Fighters 13, Street Fighter. Those were the two 2D, like, really neutral, footsie-based games that were left. The rest of them are basically anime games. <laughs> like that's kind of just that's just how fighting games are now obviously 3d fighters uh are still around but i don't really i don't really enjoy 3d fighters i don't really play them obviously tekken's huge soul caliber will always be a hit dead or alive's pretty serious but i don't really know enough to comment on those games about how you know technical they are obviously games like virtual fighter are known for being this incredibly technical game but Actually, wasn't Virtual Fighter 2D at one point, or was it always 3D? Okay, anyway. Point being, it would kind of be a shame if Street Fighter 4 was moving away from that really technical, neutral, chess match-based gameplay 
into something more like Omega or Street Fighter Cross Tekken, where you're doing all the, you know, th it's more focused upon doing really damaging, impressive combos instead of being, you know, really footsie based. I think that would be a shame to lose that in the fighting game genre. And so I really hope that my impressions of it are not entirely correct. But so far, like every single new thing that I see regarding the game, it seems to kind of highlight those thoughts that like, okay, they're moving away from this. They're trying, they're putting in zany teleports. They're put, I mean, obviously teleports have always existed, but like with Bison before, his teleports have always been slow. They're not a way for him to get in. They're a potential escape tool. Not a very great one, but still a potential escape tool. But in this one, in the release trailer, you see Bison do two very rapid teleports to get around a fireball from Nash and punish him for it. And so it's kind of, it, you know, it would be one of the things that I have to admit that really annoys me, frustrates, ooh, excuse me, frustrates me in fighting games is the recent prevalence of teleportation mechanics. Marvel has them all over the goddamn place. Uh, again, Street Fighter has some, you know, Seth has teleports, Akuma, Evil Ryu, a bunch of characters have teleports, but they're essentially almost entirely relegated to escape tools versus offensive ways to easily get in on your opponent that don't really require a lot of thought or a lot of kind of planning. It's just like, oh, you hit this button and now I'm in. And that's kind of, that's kind of just it. You know, there's nothing really complicated about it. There's nothing really to say about it. There's Again, it's just something you can use at any point in time to suddenly blow somebody up. I don't really like those mechanics. And so, you know, I'm really hoping, I'm really crossing my fingers. Because, again, anybody that could, you could show off a gameplay trailer of Seth doing, like, his teleport into a command grab or something. And people will be like, oh my god, that's bullshit! But then, in reality, it's really not that bullshit. It can be uh, with the proper wake-up kind of stuff. Like, delayed wake-up, teleporting behind with a projectile out, that can actually be very effective offensively. But, again, you know, you're cherry-picking the moments where it makes it look more useful than it actually is. So I'm kind of hoping that that's what it is. They're just showing off a moment where, like, it's, it shows itself to be really strong for the purposes of hype and entertainment. And, you know, making something look flashy versus it actually practically being uh, that amazing in like all occasions so anyway that but that's just what i'm thinking and uh, it really kind of just to summarize the entire thing it re i just really think it would be a shame if they move even further away from the street fighter uh third strike slash street fighter 4 mechanics a very strong neutral footsie based game and turn it into a more kind of anime style juggling very combo centric i really think it would be a shame to lose that because king of fighters doesn't see i don't think Unfortunately, as much as I love King of Fighters, I do not see it picking up the limelight and becoming a, you know, $500,000 prize pool tournament series all on its own kind of a deal. Unfortunately, I would love for it to, but number one, SNK doesn't really seem to have that kind of uh, motivation behind it to provide that kind of support for its game. Like, as far as I'm aware, everything, any kind of, like, prize additional uh money added to prize pots and whatnot has always come from atlas as far as i'm aware i'm not 100 percent sure on that but i can't think of a time where i heard like oh there's a one thousand dollar bonus added in here from snk it's always been added in from atlas and atlas is an amazing company they will support a game but they don't create the game they don't get to decide like hey, can you make King of Fighters 14 for us, please? Like, if SNK doesn't want to make it, they don't want to make it, pure and simple. Atlas is just the publisher, as far as I'm aware. They don't, I'm not, I don't know if they would have supplied money to them to create it in the first place. I don't know enough about uh, the relationship. You could probably look it up pretty easily, which I should probably, this is all kind of things like, hey, Google's there for a reason, brother. Go check that shit out. But, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of the same thing as Persona 4 Arena. Like, I don't think Atlas specifically, you know, they probably helped the budget. They probably said, like, yeah, we'll help you out with this. But they also, you know, Arc System Works is using their license, their characters, their world, all that shit. And so it's kind of, it's dependent upon how beneficial it is to the company making it. 
as well as how beneficial it is to the company publishing it. Because obviously both are in kind of a financial risk. It could entirely be, you know, like, the company that's publishing just says, we will bankroll the game, we will give you an extra, like, I don't know, 5% of the profits, and that's it. And so, you know, like, the majority of the profits goes to the publishing company. Because they're the ones that are taking the majority of the risk here. You know, they're bankrolling the game. They're paying for you to make this game. So, obviously, because of that, your reward due to a lack of investment, aside from just the effort required to create it, is not as serious as the monetary investment it takes to make a game nowadays. So they're going to make less off of it. So it could entirely be like SNK is just saying, we don't make enough off of this. It's not worth it. I mean, sure, you're bankrolling it. There's not much risk involved for us, or there's no risk involved for us, but there's also not enough reward involved for us to put in all of the effort it takes to create a fighting game. Which, let's be honest, fighting games take a hell of a lot of work. Like, look at King of Fighters 12. That was a terrible game. Absolutely awful. The animation was very pixelated, very off. Um, the, uh, just the balance overall was really bad. It was not a good game. It was a failure. <laughs> let's be perfectly honest. It was a failure. But they fixed it with King of Fighters 13. But think of how much effort it took to go from King of Fighters 12 to King of Fighters 13 and how much that must have cost and so you're kind of looking at that and it's like oh do we really want to pay for a King of Fighters 14 probably not and so, yeah so it's just that kind of thing is very it's a it's a frightening prospect now to create a game especially to create a game that isn't just some attempted you know like indie pixel art platformer thing that gets churned out like five new ones every single day kind of a deal you know if you want to create a proper game now the budget is astronomical it's huge and so and game prices haven't changed at all game prices have maintained basically sixty dollars always they used to be fifty right they went up ten dollars in price but so you know the investment of involved to create a game now what with all the technology behind it with uh the how much more difficult it is to create animation now especially in a game like king of fighters 13 which was hand that was hand drawn right that was the entire point behind it which is fuck that's a lot of effort so anyway i mean it's just that that's basically just kind of my thoughts is like king of fighters and street fighter are kind of the last bastion of that kind of fighting game and if street fighter walks away from that i don't see another king of fighters coming out to fill that void and that would be a very large shame for just the fighting game genre as a whole to kind of lose that very chess match based style so anyway, like i said i hope i'm wrong i hope that uh everything ends up being you know again you've seen what like Two people that are no, by no means masters of the game mechanics playing an early build of a game which is obviously not going to be flawless and is not terribly representative of the final product. And then, you know, like four game character trailers that, again, it's entirely possible that those are just cherry-picked moments intended to look cool and build up hype versus actually, again, being representative of the product. And... It's entirely possible, you know, everything may change by the time, you know, like, fan. maybe there's fan backlash on how it looks or how it seems to play, and they're like, oh, well, maybe the people don't want that. You never know what it's going to end up being versus what it is when it's basically in an alpha stage. So, uh, yeah. All right, so that's enough of that. What else do we have to talk about? Let's talk about getting trolled. <laughs> I got trolled so hard. I had a friend suggest a book series to me let me actually go check this shit out so i can actually see whether or not i bought this used or not i'm fairly certain i bought this used so the book series this friend suggested to me was the sword of truth by terry goodkind and so he said like it's a very good book series but it's also very it's trolly yeah they did so i bought it used right i'm fair i actually it doesn't really show me I don't know if I bought it new, but not from Amazon, or if I bought it 
Um, come on, show me, show me something. <laughs> show me something. Where? What am I looking for here? Why is it not showing me like additional? You know, buy new, buy used, all that shit. Oh, there we go. Condition used, very good. Books are like new, light wear to box. I bought the um, the package set because now, you know, when book series have gotten older, obviously they start selling package sets, whether it's not whether it's the entire series or if it's just, you know, three books at a time. This is the one I bought. It was three books at a time. Supposed to be books one through three. I got books two through four. <laughs> It's supposed to be books one through three. I'm looking at my order right now, and it says books one to three shows the titles of the first three books. I got two through four, though, so when I was looking through it, because I finished the previous book I was reading, which was Dune, which was a very good book, um, I, ch I you know pulled one out. I was like, all right, which one's supposed to be the first book here? So I pop it open, I start looking at all the titles, and I'm like, the first one, li I don't have the first one listed here. The first one that I have is the second one. Maybe they wrote a prequel afterwards. Maybe, you know, something, maybe something is funky. Maybe it's just, maybe this is the first written book and that's just a prequel to prequel to it. So let me check this out. Let me uh, start reading it a little bit. So I read the first chapter and very early on, it's like, oh, this happened in the previous book. This happened previous. This happened prior to this. This happened prior to this. No, this is very clearly a sequel. So then I came home and I looked it up and I was like, yep, that's book two. I got two through four instead of one through three. Ain't that excellent? And, you know, like, I'm not particularly mad about that, because obviously I just go order book one. Like, whatever, I still got three books. It's not that big of a deal, but now that the more I think of it... Because, you know, there's... Just looking at it... Oh, people also bought this with it, and it shows, you know, the collections of book four through six and seven through nine, and it's like, well, now I can't buy the box set of books four to six because I already have book four. <laughs> so, great. <laughs> it's very, um, yeah, so anyway, I, I got trolled. I got trolled. This is why you don't buy used shit, God damn it. <sighs> it's a shame, just... Describing the life of Nate. Oh, also, another thing that I got trolled with today. So today was my very first um, final. This is finals week for me. Not all that busy, because none of my classes... My classes are very easy. My classes are remarkably easy. So I have no, like, stress involved with these finals right now. Nothing really, you know, scaring me. But so I had my first final today. It takes me 25 minutes to drive from my house to the college I go to. And then, obviously, 25 minutes to drive back. And so, you, the, technically, you're taking the final for this class online because you're taking it via the school's website. And then the benefit to doing this is that the answers are already all filled out for you. Like, it's just, they, the system basically takes a pool of questions, randomizes the order so students can't just be like, yo, what'd you get for number one? And, you know, everybody has the same quiz. It's all, it's randomized. Sometimes people, like my previous programming professor, he made it so, like, there was a pool of something like 50 quite let's just i don't know exactly what the amount was but let's just pretend for an example's sake he would make a quiz that had 50 possible questions and then when you actually clicked on the test it would just randomly pull 25 of those to give them to you so nobody has the same uh the exact same questions nobody has the same order of questions it's all randomized and but the, again the benefit to it is that once you finish the computer has all the answers. It automatically grades it for you. So once you're done, it tells you what you got immediately. That's both good and bad, because how shitty would it be to go through, like, a test, and you're like, oh, this is out of 100. I'm nailing this. I'm murdering it. Click on submit. You got 40 out of 100. Ooh. That would actually... I should have done that. How fun would, like, how both fun and trolly would that be to just sit back... And just watch faces at this moment. Like somebody just clicks submit and you see their face just fall. Like lip starts quivering. A tear starts coming down their eye. Like, I just failed the class. Oh no. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be fun? Because I'm evil. Because <laughs> I'm sadistic as hell I guess. Just to be able to see that kind of shit. But yeah so 25 minutes to drive there. 25 minutes to drive back home. You cannot. Because technically you can take it online. But the. 
professors can password protect it. So unless you're there for the professor to tell you, hey, this is the password, and you end up not being able to take it unless you have a friend that'll, like, text you, hey, the password is X. But why would you do that to a friend? Like, that'd be pretty fucked up, right? You send a friend in, they don't get to be able to sit at home and, like, check Google and shit. They gotta send you the password. That'd be fucked up. That'd be very selfish. But, uh, so anyway, regardless of all of that, again, 25 minutes there, 25 minutes back. Took me eight minutes to take that fucking test. Eight minutes. I'm not even trying to say that to, like, brag. You know, it's a multiple choice quiz. It is in no way, shape, or form difficult. Like, half of it was actually questions directly pulled from our midterm. There were quite a few questions that I was just going through and I was like, I've already done this before. I've also already done this before. I have also already... You lazy motherfucker. <laughs> it, it was crazy. But the thing that uh, bugged me the most, it was 59 questions worth 133 points. Why could you just not add one more question on there that was worth two points? Just even it out a little bit. Make it look pretty. That's actually the thing that murders me the most in math. Like, if you ever, I'm sure everybody has experienced this in math. You fuck up one little thing throughout the process of doing an equation. But, for some reason, that fuck up ends up giving you, like, this perfect, beautiful, even whole number. And you're like, damn, that's a really neat question. Ended very nicely. All right, on to the next one. And then you come to find out the answer was like the square root of pi times 2.796 divided by E. And it's just like, oh, wow, I really fucked that one up. How the hell did I come up with like two? What the fuck? That, and that screws me up so often because you come up with this, you know, nice and neat answer. You're like, oh, that must be it. It's nice and neat. But no, it was supposed to be some fucked up nonsensical thing that you could never do without a supercomputer to guide your way. Ugh! Murders me. But, you know, you, it's nice to get that even number. It feels good. And so you want it to be even. So anyway, what, what else has life trolled me with lately? Is there anything else that I can fill the next three minutes of this Dark Souls trolled the hell out of me, actually. <laughs> Come to think of it. Fucking Crystal Cave. That's all I got. That's all I got. I'm not even going to say anything else. Fucking Crystal Cave. Fuck that place. It really is kind of odd how... Demon Souls is the only one that really escapes this, because Demon Souls, you can technically play in almost any order you want. I think the only uh, active hindrance to your progress is that in World 1, once you beat the boss of World 1, 2, you have to beat one of the main bosses of Worlds 2 to 5 before you can progress further in World 1. I think that's the only, like, barrier to progress. So you can, so technically this doesn't really apply to Demon Souls, but obviously Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2, there's still a fairly significant amount of options open to you that you can choose where to go, when to go there. It's not entirely linear, but there's still a very obvious progression. In Dark Souls 1, you have the Lord Vessel, which prevents you from going to the Duke's Archives or the Tomb of Giants, or Lost Isolith, or the end of... Um, actually, you're not really prevented from going to the end of the Ruins of New Londo. You can kill the... Like, there's an NPC there where he will not give you a key that you need to progress further into the area until after you acquire the Lord Vessel. But you can also just kill him, and he drops the key. So technically, you can go there early, so it's not really, uh, like, barriered off to you like the other three are. But it's still, like, you know, you have to kill an NPC to do this. Do you really want to, Are you really that evil? Most people are, yes. But I like to uh, not go to the ruins of New Londo. For, I like to stave that off for as long as I can, because fuck the ruins of New Londo. But it really is, like... The beginning of Dark Souls 1, and obviously I can't remember much of Dark Souls 2. I've tried to get back into it. Because after I beat this game, I was like, hey, I just beat this game. I really enjoyed it. Let me go back to Dark Souls 2 and see what my mentality is now. I got like 10 minutes into it. And I was like, eh, nah. I'm good. I'll, I'll, I'm not. There's too much awkwardness to it. Like, in Dark Souls 2 so far, num the number one, the biggest factor, adaptability. For those of you that have not played Dark Souls 2, there is an additional... So, like, in Dark Souls 1, the invincibility of your roles is predetermined. There's, like, three different roles I think you can get. You have the one where... And it's determined by how much weight you have equipped. 
So, um, light roll is something like less than 15% of your overall potential uh, equip load, which you can increase by increasing endurance. And then the regular roll is something like 50, like, and underneath 50% or 60% or something like that. And then you have fat roll, where if you're just wearing ridiculously heavy armor, you roll and the earth shakes and you move at about, like, I don't know, half a mile an hour. It's very sad to see. <laughs> it's very sad to see, but that's the third roll. And all of them are just, you know, they have their specific frames of invincibility. As far as I'm aware, nothing changes that. Versus Dark Souls 2, there is a, uh, a, a skill in, not a skill, is it a skill? Whatever. Some kind of, uh, let's just say a skill called adaptability. Where that is what determines the invincibility frames of your role. And so if you want to not have a role that only has like one single frame of invincibility, you have to churn points into adaptability. And that fucking sucks. And the reason why it fucking sucks is because blocking also sucks. Like in Dark Souls 1, anything but the heaviest of attacks, if you block it, obviously you're blocking it with a shield. The person hitting your shield is going to feel that impact. They're going to be a little stunned from it. You can't just, you know, it's not a movie. You can't just hack at shields over and over. Like, your sword will break before the shield gets any damage to it. That's kind of how shields work. That's how they're intended. That's why they were created, is to prevent shit like that. But in Dark Souls 2, I never once encountered a single enemy where their attack just did not go through the shield as if it didn't exist. Like, it wouldn't do any health damage to me. It would still block the health damage and I would take, you know, a certain amount of stamina would be taken away. But their weapon would still pass right through it like it did not just meet this solid sheet of metal. And so, you know, there's no rebounding. There's no real way to be like, okay, let me block this real quick and now I can do a counterattack. Or, you know, it, the only way you can do it is to either parry or roll. Otherwise, they just continue with their combo chains like you're not sitting there with the massive sheet of metal right in front of you, their weapon just passes through it like it's butter. That's fucking stupid. So, and the movement overall too is very awkward. It's very, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but it just, it felt wrong. It felt off. And so like I said, I got about 10 minutes into it. I was like, eh, I'd rather just play something else. So I don't know, but anyway, to get to the entire point, we remember how much I hated the final, like, I guess 25% of Dark Souls 2. I really don't particularly enjoy the final 25% of this either. Like, Gwyn and like the area before Gwyn, that's iconic. That's an amazing area. You just have these black knights uh, that are, you know, the remnants of Gwyn's forces. Then you have to fight Gwyn himself. It's an amazing area. But before that, you have to go through the Crystal Caves, the fucking Lava Pit of Lost Isleth, the, what am I trying to think? Duke's Archives really is not that bad. But obviously Duke uh, Duke's Archives precedes the Crystal Caves. The Crystal Caves fucking suck. Oh, Tomb of Giants. Tomb of Giants also suck unless you have some autonomous way to light the path. So like if you go to Lost Isleth first and you get the Sunlight Maggot Helmet, that's fantastic. I don't really have that big of a problem with it at that point. But if your only source of light is the Skull Lantern, the Tomb of Giants fucking sucks. I hate that place. And so it's just, you know, you have all this shit where it's like, yo, I'm really enjoying exploring. This forest is amazing. The undead parish is amazing. Even the depths is pretty cool. It's kind of like a feature. It's not, I mean, obviously it's not that big. Well, no, the depths is actually, if you include the part where uh, the capper demon and then to, down to the gaping demon. Even that, like, it's kind of frustrating to get through a little bit because the enemy stuff in there is, and obviously you have those cursed frogs. Uh, the Great Hollow, Ash Lake, both amazing. Blight Town obviously fucking sucks, but it's it was all it wouldn't actually be anywhere near as bad were it not for the frame rate issues. But still, it's just like out of all of the areas in the game, the ones that I hate the most are the ones that are in like the final quarter of the game: Lost Eyes, Lith, Crystal Caves, Tomb of Giants. In Dark Souls 2, the areas that I hate the most, the Shrine of Amana or whatever the hell it was called, the Dragon Shrine. All of these places are in the final 25% of the game. And so it's just kind of like, the first 75% is so fun and amazing. And then I get the Lord Vessel and I'm kind of like, eh, maybe I should just make a new character and go through this shit again. <laughs> so anyway, I have now gone far over my 30 minutes. Thank you for listening. 
Hope y'all have a wonderful day. Hope life doesn't troll you the way it's been trolling me.